We'll try. We'll see. Okay, no worries. Let me start by paying respect to Professor King. But I've chosen two really pertinent quotations. The greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, it's the illusion of knowledge. And intelligence is the ability to adapt. Oh. Yeah. Now, I've always been very wary about the term mitral and, uh, you know, we've attributed it to Andreas. And frankly, if you look at the plain view of the meter, it doesn't look like a mitral valve. So I think this was the first ever misnaming of a organ in the body. And perhaps Leonardo da Vinci should have got the correct ta um, attribute to have labeled it, but he was more interested in the subvalvular structure and may not have actually labeled it correctly either. And perhaps there should have been a Punjabi who would have labeled it. But we are here. And let's look at what we are talking about. Median sternotomy is safer than minimal invasive techniques. Okay, so, so we are talking about a singular median sternotomy versus a plural minimal invasive techniques. So not a single technique. Well, well why? Well, it's a collection of techniques, isn't it? It's a collection of techniques where you have thoracotomy, direct vision, video-assisted, robotic. We, we heard very good results and various types of cannulation, central cannulation, peripheral cannulation, different pathologies, and there's always been a debate about infective endocarditis, and something which is dear to me. Um, so, essentially, you want to do the same operation, reach the mitral valve through a narrow neck with a long distance. You can see it directly, but hey, we're going to do it standing far apart rather than go through a wider incision. Well, there's, again, just a, a quick depiction. So there's no standardization. We agree for that. It's a surgeon in institution preference and experience. And I'll touch very little on concomitant procedures because it's probably outside the remit of this talk. But generally, we are doing a lot of concomitant tricuspid AF ablation and occlusion. You saw so many talks in the first session about that. Uh, so what's the difference? Is the difference only incision? And it's smaller. Well, yeah. But when it comes to CPB and cross clamp, longer? And there are various issues, isn't it? There's, there's venous drainage issues. There's many other issues, retrograde blood flow, central cannulation. I covered that. But it does translate into a perceived benefit. Now, this is perceived. You, you saw, you know, there is no data. The perceived benefit to whom? Patient? or actually the surgeon and the institution. I wouldn't go into anything to do with DRG in Germany or anything in the US. But in the UK, we've got to be very fair. We are balancing cost versus effectiveness because it's the NHS. So there are no capitalist issues here that would actually influence my practice. And and Enoch you know, quite rightly said, equipoise. Well, you could define equipoise, but not really. Randomized studies are available. I'll go through a little bit. And specific characteristics of patients who undergo this operation are quite different. So can we compare them? We can't. We've got really a lot of improvement on echo. So we, we know now that the repair rate is very high. We don't really want to. A lot of people have published papers, including in position papers, including in uh, guidelines. But what you don't see, a minimal invasive is not mentioned. We talk about intervention. We talk about repair. We talk about referral to an intervention. We talk about referral to a repair center. But we don't have data to say that they should go to a minimal invasive center. Walkmar Fark, this is a very early paper. I bought it just for the sake of trying to create a little bit of irritation so that uh, we can say that, you know, mortality rates initially were very high, 10%. But it was safe, effective, and durable as the traditional approach. And I'll go to my esteemed opponent. A couple of reviews. I'm terribly sorry for that. But this one is a very interesting review because it highlights the fact that he does expect improvement to happen, but in areas that are unlikely to be tested with traditional trials. Hey. Let's look at another one, another review, the opportunities of minimal invasive. What, what is he looking at? 
you know, probable search, applying the term minimal invasive, 10,000 manuscripts, seven only trials, four mitral, just three. Look at the number of patients in each trial. Total, 340, and you still have a quarter to a fifth increase in bypass and cross clamp time. And we agree there is a pre-selection. So there is bound to be a pre-selection of patients which are highly successful to give us the best result. And we are probably not publishing the less good results, aren't we? And why is this driven for? The driven is because, of course, you go to a patient and say, I'm going to do the same operation with a big incision or a small incision. Anybody would say, but is that the right thing to do? We've got to look at durability and safety and et cetera, et cetera. So it's actually driven by a patient perceived benefit compounded by maybe an institutional benefit. Well, it is more demanding. There is a higher rate of reoperation, increased postoperative bleeding, thromboembolic, poor visualization, and you know, a lot of people, and we will look at return to normal activity. So let's try and be a genius in trying to see what we find from data. I'm sorry, my colleague who was going to talk just before me uh, couldn't be here. It would have been nice to have him here. Uh, but look at this data, okay? You've got isolated mitral wall repair, isolated annuloplasty, and mitral wall replacement. Together, 45% of the cases that he's done, isolated annuloplasty or replace the wall through a minimal invasive approach. So half of the patients are very simple, very straightforward, annuloplasty or replace. And then look at the tricuspid NAF rate, much smaller. You heard Nirvad saying, yeah, I mean, you know, in a person of his category, he's in excess of, I was surprised, 90% is what he's saying. And of course, again, a potential bias may be there, and we have something new now come up, a learning curve. So let's try and understand what and how and what the cosmos is. Now we are, things have improved quite a lot. We have a mitral MDT, mitral surgeon, learning curve, mitral intervention, and absolute versus relative contraindications, but there is certainly still a perception that there are con um, contraindications for that. But let's look at learning curve. This is Joe Chikwe from David Adams Group. Very nice manuscript. I would highly recommend it you look at. They came to the conclusion that you need to do around 25 mitral valves. You to have, have had done and continue maintaining that with at least 25. So you read between the lines. You read at many manuscripts, you need to do around 100 to 300 cases. And if practice is 25, 50 cases per year, three, five, six years. You could start by getting trained only in mini-mitral and probably take less time. I'm not saying no. But this is also an important part that you need to be aware of. Let's look at another review. Um, this was obviously to see what does, why, why does the controversy still persist and all those arguments that we had. So mortality outcomes, well, fine, they are same. Well, we agree, they are no worse, we are, they are same. But what happened to cardiopulmonary bypass time? Yes, every manuscript is showing that it is worse. I, I don't want to go into another manuscript of showing that bypass time more than 90 may be detrimental, but of course that was there. And maybe we have improved the bypass techniques now that it doesn't matter. But look at this. When it comes to aortic dissection and stroke, maybe same, no better, but two are worse. Now everybody talks, if you don't have a trial, let's do a propensity match analysis. Well, there's one here, propensity match analysis, and they found <coughs> around 97 patients, not bad. But here I want you to concentrate on unmatched group patients and matched group patients, and the p-value. But when you look at the matched group patients, what does come out as significant? The first two, bypass and cross clamp time, everything else is gone. In an unmatched group, sure, all of them are P more than, uh, less than 001. And then look at the survival in the matched and the unmatched group. Very interesting still. In the matched group, actually, it starts falling down. 
Ha, huh. okay. So highly selected group of patients, don't match them, then you will be better. Fine, I'm not saying no. And then, you know, we, 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 we will wait. Again, Minimatural will look at the physical, psychological component. But this um, uh, matched study did that and did not find any difference. So we are not sure. There might be post-operative pain and scar cosmesis, which presumably would be improved by smaller incision, but little evidence. There are some surveys, but there is actually no uh, comparison. Yeah. Now, I won't go too much, but tricuspid intervention, okay. We are trying to do a operation, minimally invasive, on the mitral, protect the right ventricle, knowing that the right ventricle tricuspid regurgitation is a functional tricuspid regurgitation, is not an organic disease. We want to put an annuloplasty ring, not protect the RV that well, and still complete the operation with an increased bypass time and not sure that the RV is that protected. AF ablation. I, I, you heard, again, <laughs> a very good talk before me of, about all the lesion sets that you need to do and what are the relative rates of success. But the most thing which is also very dear to me is the left atrial occlusion. Minimal invasive, a lot of people say we'll stitch it from inside. And you read manuscripts, there's a 30% failure rate, or a 30% reopening rate, or a 30% recanalization rate when it is stitched from inside. And I'm not even going into talking about remodeling because we haven't looked at that and we will take many years to get into that. So what are we going to talk about finally? You heard, you know about Venn diagrams and the overlapping Venn diagrams that gives you a overlapping patient that could be applied to both the categories. I'm going to introduce you to something called the Punjabi triangles. Sorry about that. <laughs> because I wasn't able to risk stratify the Venn diagram, but I was able to risk stratify the triangle. So you have this big triangle, median sternotomy, with a lot of patients who may not have good ventricles, multiple procedures, complex procedures, and undergo an operation. I'm, I'm just concentrating on mitral. But there is definitely a small, low-risk, isolated, highly selected group of patients that could have minimal invasive surgery and have good outcomes, but certainly not for everyone. Why? Because if it is not durable, you will have to come back and pay the fine. And I'll end by Sapiens. If you haven't read it, give me your name and address. I'll send a free book to you. It follows that in order to change an existing imagined order, we must first believe in an alternative imagined order. The most important part is there is no way out of the imagined order. When we break down our prison walls and run towards freedom, we are in fact running into the more spacious exercise yard of a bigger prison. Thank you very much. Yeah.